It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Over the weekend, I got to spend some some quality time with my youngest daughter. And look, um, we spent the entire day together, which, you know, at, at almost being 16, incredibly rare. So I, I jumped at the opportunity when we had... We went, to, we went out to eat. We went for a nice long car ride up into the mountains. It was a great, it's a great day. And in that time, we had a chance to, you know, to, to, to talk like I try to do as often as possible, get where her head's at, what her, what her hopes, her dreams, her feelings, where she, she views her future and what some of her fears are. And, you know, oddly enough, the, the idea of presidential politics came up, which understand my kids, they're not that involved in it. They're kids. Um, they're, they're involved in, in, you know, teenager, you know, early 20 people stuff, not, you know, every waking minute being something political like, like dad. And, you know, everyone thinks, you know, they, cause they're, they're my kids that they're going to be hyper political. No, they've gone the other direction. Uh, I do enough of it for both of them, but she did bring up the fact that, um, look, you know, she wants to have the same rights that her mother had. Uh, she views what's going on as an assault on her ability to pursue the future that she wants to, to, to create for herself. And, you know, and also this idea that, wow, um, that, that Trump guy's crazy. Have you, have you heard him? And the answer is, yeah. You know, it's one of those things where I'll, I'll be honest, when my, my 16 year old is aware of just how far off the beaten path things have gotten um, and understands it's only going to get worse. Her concern for her future is, is something that I take very seriously. And, you know, I look at the Trump campaign, which is, you know, really just kind of all over the place. Seems more about the, 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 the graph than it is about getting elected. Uh, I don't know if you've looked at his, at his campaign site and and his business site, uh, they're they're all hawking political stuff, uh, you know. And it seems like a for profit enterprise, to be honest. In fact, the Washington Post actually did a story on this, and and oddly enough, in the most Trump thing ever, the the merchandise that he's selling on his his company's website uh, is actually higher priced than the campaign website, which is weird. Uh, but in the most Trumpian thing ever. Uh, and my daughter picked up on this stuff. She goes, you know, th- these this guy seems just not somebody that should be leading, you know, uh, ants to a picnic. And I agreed. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that she sees this and that her friends see this. Because if you watched over the weekend, Trump's whatever that was from Wisconsin, uh, his, his pep rally, um, you know, he talked about, you know, I'm going to end the war in Ukraine on day one. Would have never started if it weren't, if I were in, in politics. Now understand this speech was supposed to be about the economy, um, but Ukraine, he's going to do away with the Department of Education, uh, how he's going to save us from World War III. There was a whole bunch of, of stuff. Uh, but the biggest, well, a couple of the biggest takeaways was, on the f- fundamental misunderstanding of how government works. He said he's going to eliminate the Department of Education and put it back into the hands at the state level, which he said, quote, going to send it back to the states so that Ron Johnson can run it. Ron Johnson is a U.S. senator, has no ability to run state education programs. Federal Department of Education, he's got to say in state level, not. And he goes, OK, well, we'll send it back here to Mr. Tiffany. Well, Mr. Tiffany is Tom Tiffany, the congressman, the U.S. congressman, not the state level representative, but the U.S. level congressman, federal level, again, not dealing with the Department of Education uh, at a state level. 
But that wasn't even the worst thing. I mean, the fact that he, his nonsensical ramblings led him into more about Hannibal Lecter and more about how he was the, you know, the most brilliant orator since FDR. Uh, what do you say? Not since Franklin Delano Roosevelt has a speech been made so brilliantly or delivered so well uh, that he said of his last State of the Union, you go, um, I don't know that one, you should be talking about yourself in the third person. Uh, and two, that that speech, sorry, doesn't rise to that level. He went on to talk about J.D. Vance. He said, you know, I could have picked I picked the best athlete. I could have picked anyone. He said uh, they would have been great. But J.D. has been in, has, has had an incredible life. I didn't know J.D. Vance was an athlete. Um, OK, and then he goes on about Al Capone. Claims that he's been indicted more than Al Capone, which isn't true. Capone is indicted at least six times, Trump just four. But praising the fact that Capone was this horrible, murderous ga gangster and that, you know, if you didn't like him, you were just gone. Um, this is a presidential speech. And we wonder why Liz Cheney, a, for a Republican, has come out and said, look, you know, Trump's policies, um, it, he's a danger. He is a clear and present danger. If you saw her on, on Sunday on the show, on the ABC show, very clear why she was endorsing Kamala Harris, which is kind of a big freaking deal. As she pointed out, those of us who are conservative, those of us who believe in the fidelity of the Constitution have a responsibility and a duty to recognize this is not about partisan politics. And this is what I've been saying for a while. It's about saving the republic. It's about taking out someone who is a clear and present danger at the ballot box, the way we're supposed to. Interesting times that we we live in. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show .com. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, Sarah Burris from Ross Story going to be here to share some thoughts on the top stories of the day. Back after this. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is, though, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The new CHIPS bill that got passed will bring jobs back home and has already resulted in big announcements of major new factories opening. The American Recovery Package has allowed cities and counties to hire new police officers and firefighters and start rebuilding their communities again. We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice. So on Friday, the Fraternal Order of Police, the FOP, uh, they endorsed they endorsed a felon. Uh, you know, I kept seeing cops for crooks all over the place. You know, maybe dogs and cats can't sleep together. Who knows? Um, and I don't know, look, it sounds funny, <laughs> but um, they did. They endorsed Donald Trump for president, a guy who was convicted of 34 felonies. Uh, so uh, look, there there might be hope. Maybe, 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 maybe. Or maybe not. Uh, here to share some thoughts on, uh, is this an important endorsement? Are we surprised by this endorsement? Our good friend, Sarah Burris, she's a reporter over at Raw Story, rawstory.com, the website, if you want to take a look at the work that she's done. she got a story on this. Sarah, thanks for taking time for us. How the heck are you? I'm good. So, cops for crooks. Um, thoughts? Man, that's the saddest thing that I've ever seen. That, well, the... the the first of the saddest things I'd ever seen is, do you remember Michael Fanone? Um, after all of that went down, everything on January 6th went down and, um, and, and he and the other, some of the other Capitol police were, um, 
you know, were basically rendered unable to work anymore. And he desperately was trying to get the FOP to come out and say something. He, at the very least, I remember one of the things he tried to do is get the FOP president to, uh, uh, to, to stop all of the, the lies from the members of Congress about, you know, a police officer shooting Ashley Babbitt uh, when it was a Secret Service officer and, you know, just stupid stuff that, uh, you know, I, I, it should have been easy for him, right? And the yeah. FOP wouldn't do it. And so I feel like the FOP really is not in it for the actual officers or they're in it for some officers, but not all of them. And at the very least, they're in it for some of the most powerful criminals that they can find. Or at least and one. It's, and it's sad. It's sad and it's pathetic, but frankly, it's not something that I'm surprised about. <laughs> Uh, and speaking of crimes, uh, what's the latest on Trump's hush money trial? I, I know there's some big news banging around. Yeah, so they have delayed the sentencing until November 26th. And um, it's sad. It's depressing. Uh, the reason for this is that Trump asked for it to be delayed. And um, the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, basically said, yeah, we understand if you would want to do it. And we won't really fight back if you do. So yeah, you should push it off to January 6th. This way you could have had, you know, <laughs> what's the thing is, is like, um, it really removes Trump's argument that everything is political, right? Like his whole thing is all of these cases are political. Everything's about the election. So having the sentencing after the election removes part of that. I don't know that necessarily it will matter because I'm not sure that, you know, people pay that close of attention. But here we are. Yeah, I mean, personally, I I thought this should have been a lot of these cases should have been pushed till after the election. And I know there's arguments on all sides of it. Uh, you know, if he becomes president, it all gets quashed, and that's true too. Uh, but you know, the appearance he's used he's used the appearance of impropriety uh, as well as he was going to be able to. I think. Well, the thing I keep thinking is if you compare it to what happened with with uh, Judge Shutkin in the 2020 case in Washington. She basically said, look, I'm moving forward with this because this is the timeline that I'm presented. If you're running for office, like that's not my fault. That wasn't yeah. my suggestion. Uh, that was your decision. And what I feel like Judge Mershon did in New York is he said, I don't wanna play politics with this. I don't wanna have any appearance of politics. Thus, I'm going to take politics into account. And so that piece of it kind of, I, I get, I get the need to remove politics from it, but then don't turn around and tell me that you didn't make a political decision because that in and of itself is a political decision. No, I mean, there's, there's, look, there's no right answer here. I, I just don't think there is. I, uh, other than, and this is where a lot of people will come on, you know, he broke the law. He should be treated like anyone else. Uh, no one's above the law, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, so Yep. We'll see where it takes us uh, come November. I wanted to get your thoughts also on the fact that it seems, and this is weird to me, seems that Donald Trump can't seem to stop attacking E. Jean Carroll. Seems incapable of learning a lesson. When will he stop? Or does he, I, I, does he like being sued? You know, that is the weirdest thing. Uh, and I remember, uh, I think whenever they made the um, the jury made the decision and, and he was awarded or uh, she was awarded the cash from him the, the last time. I remember her attorney, Robbie Kaplan, coming on uh, TV and saying, you know, we this may there may be a fourth or fifth time because Trump had defamed her again after that on the at the CNN town hall. And she was like, you know, I, I think we'll try and see what we can do that. The problem is if the, there's not a lot of case law because you don't usually have somebody who's defaming someone four or five, six, seven times, like generally they stop. Yeah. Generally they run out of money or, or you know, they run out of legal fees. Yeah. And I, I just don't know what you do at that point. Like if he doesn't stop, if he can't stop himself from defaming her and financial penalties are not working, like what do you do? Like what is the next decision for the judge in that case? Well, obviously, I think in the civil case, I think most of it is just the ability to to keep you know bigger and bigger you know penalties. Uh, which but what you, happens you, if somebody runs out of money? Yeah, I mean, eventually, you, if you get him down to the point where he's got to go sell pencils on the street corner with a tin cup, maybe maybe he stops then. Maybe, maybe. 
or maybe not. Uh, speaking of weird endorsements, uh, Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney uh, endorsed Kamala Harris. Seems a little weird to me. Not so much Liz, uh, right. but Dick. Seems a little weird. Yeah. I mean, it makes kind of sense for Liz Cheney just based off of the fact that she's been threatened, um, you know, with, with MAGA people who want to kill her. So it doesn't surprise me that she would then go to the other side. But Dick Cheney is like, Dick Cheney is like Darth Vader voting against. Um, yeah, right. The, right. Like, that, I, I, it just, that blows my mind. Here's like, the weird for, thing. Here's the is, weird thing. He, if somebody from the Death Star, right? Somebody from the Death Star is being like, nope, can't do it. Yeah, but here's the <laughs> weird thing to me. Um, I, I, sh I know I shouldn't say this, but I actually respect Dick Cheney. This is one of those moments where a father standing by his daughter you know, I don't know if he agrees with what she's doing. I don't know if he if he's on the Kamala side. But this to me in this moment is kind of an important thing for me because, I, you know, I look at you look at the did you see the Walls family uh, with the weird with the misspelled T-shirts? Yes. Uh, yes. With the apostrophe in the wrong spot going, hey, yeah, mm -hmm. we're stupid too. Uh, yeah. Coming out against their relative or his brother, his own mm -hmm. freaking brother coming out and and, and coming out against him. Yeah. You know, for me, this idea that that family, you know, kind of matters that that a father would stick by his daughter. I got as much as I despise Dick Cheney and I do. You know, well, I think the big difference between the two of these is that Dick Cheney is still very close with his family, whereas Jeff Waltz and Tim Waltz are not very close like they've been estranged for a long time there's that side of the family that lives in nebraska and his family who lives in minnesota and um so like it doesn't surprise me as somebody who has some estranged family right that people would you know pick their politics over their family um i do yeah. think it's weird in in the sense that generally you just wouldn't you wouldn't want to bring attention on yourself. Like, to me, that's the thing is to be like, I don't want, you know, I may oppose this person or uh, feel estranged from my family, but I'm not going to like say, woo, 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 over here because it just seems. Or, or air your dirty laundry in public, you know, as my, yeah. my grandma always said, keep your behind out of the street. Um, and you know, that's well, part of it. On a t-shirt. <laughs> Right. And make sure you have a, a spell checker. Um, yeah. But, you know, for me, and, and I was talking about this with my younger daughter, as I said earlier, um, why would you attack your, your family? I mean, if you, yeah. you disagree with them, shut the blank up, you know, okay. I want the, I want to do, I want them to do well. I want them to be okay. I want them to be successful. I'm not going to be the reason that they fail. I, I just, I think we've lost a little bit of the family value thing from the party of family values. Yeah, but then again, that's been a, the hypocrisy of the far, part me, party of family values, right? Is that they never really have been about family. They're about certain types of families. Yeah. And I, my, the fascinating thing to me about this was, um, was Jeff Waltz made some comment on his Facebook. Where he was like, oh, the stories I could tell you. And then MAGA just went crazy because they're yeah. like, oh my God, there's a scandal. There's a scandal. And essentially it turned into another tan suit episode where you find out that the scandal the like ooh, the stories i could tell you is he yeah. has motion sickness really yeah, got what do you and mean then he that? barfed on people like as a kid it's like oh don't even get me started on boats okay like oh i gotta i gotta wear the patch for getting on a boat yeah i, saw, I heard that story i'm going really that's that's what you got and yeah. that's what conservative media picked up you better get your Russian your talking points in, in order better. Like they need to hack something because at this point, all they've got is he pet somebody else's dog. Um, he, he made fun of how he doesn't have a lot of spices and food. Um, and he made a tater tot casserole, like love and that called guy. it a hot dish, which people don't understand what that means. <laughs> love, that, love that guy. I gotta tell you, love that guy. Uh, you know, you, we could be twins. Um, but you know, these kind of attacks are, are kind of funny. I mean, like, I, I don't, did you see the one with Kamala Harris where, uh, well, she didn't really work at McDonald's. That's the big lie. And I gotta be honest. I'm going to be honest here. Uh, the, the Harris campaign came out with a, with a defense 
And and I kind of buy it. I'm I'm kind of, you know, there's part of me that goes, maybe, maybe the McLeay is true. Um, they said that she worked the register and manned the fries and the ice cream machines. I don't know. The ice cream machines don't work. <laughs> so okay, so if you remember when the McFlurry happened, I was a child when the McFlurry happened, but before the McFlurry, there were the shakes. They've no, had the shakes my entire life. Yeah, yeah. And cones. Right. And so, um, but yeah, half the time they don't work. Um, which is a shame. But, then, but I will tell you the reason I actually think it's true is because they set out a timeline and they were like, she basically worked there for a summer. Yeah. No, no, I, I believe like, you. I believe she actually did. <laughs> Who's gonna lie about working at McDonald's? For a summer. Yeah. I worked at Wendy's for a couple of months until I got fired. Um it's not something I, I'm proud of or that I'm lo- look, it was good work. It was, you know, it was, as a kid needed the needed the work before I went off to college. It was, it was hard. It was greasy. It, I respect people who do that work. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't do it. I got fired ultimately for throwing a frosty at, at someone uh, because she threw um, French fries with ketchup all over them at me. So her frosty went back at her and that was the end. That was the end of my Wendy's career. Uh, so there you have it. I will say the smartest thing my mother ever told me is she worked at uh, Baskin Robbins when she was a teenager. And she said that her arm just got fierce strong, you know, because dip in the ice cream, yeah. you know, you're really using your muscles. And, um, but, you know, it's totally lopsided. You end up with like one side really like lopsided. It's like Popeye, the other one side, the other side is <laughs> olive oil. Is it's more like olive oil, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I got to get your thoughts on the, 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 on a serious note, I got to get your thoughts on Trump's speech at the economic club of New York, which seemed really That's kind a of, serious note. Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it shows me that the guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about and oh that God. even when he writes things down, it's insane. I, you know, I think some of it was him just completely going off the cuff. And I know for a fact that when they were asking him questions, he had no idea what the questions were going to be, which is exceptionally rare. Like usually if he's going to go to something and they're going to ask him questions, um, he's going to know ahead of time. I mean, especially after what happened with the National Association of Black Journalists and the questions that they were asking him there. You know, I don't think after just bombing at that, you would think that they would ask, you know, ahead of time, like, what are you going to ask him? So at least they can prepare and they can give him some kind of talking points. But this whole thing on childcare, I mean, basically went up there and he was like, well, you know, childcare. Ooh. And it's like, it's, it's like that. I mean, really legitimately, there was a scene in the West wing. Um, it, whenever, um, Bartlett was running against a guy that was supposed to be George W. Bush, but he was the governor of Florida. And he was just like, you know, a redneck good old boy who didn't know any better. And his comment was, crime, boy, I don't know. And that's the kind of thing that I feel like was happening with Trump whenever you ask him about things that he really, truly doesn't understand anything about. Um, I mean, I think that he they've told him enough about things like groceries where, you know, I, I doubt he knows um, how to how to work a self-checkout and he probably doesn't know the exact price of milk, but at the very least he knows that groceries are expensive. Um, but <laughs> childcare, that's a big deal. But then again, he's already lost women. And, yeah. and um, they've they've had members of a campaign saying basically like we're not even gonna try and get women anymore because we know we can't. Well you shouldn't, because so. look, you've got Trump on one side, and on the other you got JD Vance, who you know, I don't know. I know you've been t- paying attention, and I'm sure most women have, um, because he's got some really screwy views. That dude has some serious issues. And what's interesting to me is he just appeared at some um, mega church mega church where he spoke and the church leader there is the same kind of person who is advocating this whole like, you know, don't leave marriage if you, your marriage, if you're being abused, like, because you need to be there for the children. Like, sure, you, your spouse could be beating the hell out of the children, but, you yeah, know, because don't what, what better example for your daughters? Uh, that right? being beat up in front of them so that they can get or into- molested. Like yeah. that's the thing, right? Is you're like, you're legitimately telling me that if it, if a daughter is being molested, um, that you shouldn't leave the, the marriage. Like that's just really disturbing, but that's what this, this preacher believed. And he was spinning that same kind of thing 
you know, like a year after J.D. Vance was talking about, you know, I don't think somebody should leave a marriage just because they're being abused. Just because they're getting beaten. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, it, but again, uh, not all of us have a, a mother-in-law who can take a year sab sabbatical to come and take care of our children. God, seriously. That's the other thing is he's like, you know, oh, we're going to, we're going to fix childcare by basically making your grandparents do it. It's like, okay, first of all, have you noticed that people can't, you know, in, in a lot of the part of the country, people can't live on social security. So you have a lot of seniors who are still working after yep. 65 and um, just so that they can make something extra and maybe hold off social security longer. So the check will be higher. And, um, <laughs> and then the other idea is, well, what if you don't live in the same area of the country? What if you have a sibling like like uh, Tim Waltz, you know, where he lives in Minnesota and, and his mother and his brother live in Nebraska? Like, what does the mother need to move across state lines? Like, how does she then care for both of her grandchildren? Like, this just doesn't, they don't think about these things. They don't actually think it forward and understand how these things work, which, again, are things that I feel like moms are doing in this process and and women consider like what are the logistics of this how's this going to work um and it clearly they are just not in that mindset of yeah. you know i gotta i gotta figure out how to make something work yeah and the other question is do you really want your your, your mother-in-law around that much right <laughs> i mean i don't know love my mother-in-law i'm not i'm not i'm not bad mouthing my mother-in-law i got a good one uh but you know i do know people who who aren't as fortunate as I am. I think I saved myself there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because look, I mean, I, you know, I would love to live in this Walton's kind of world again, but we're just yeah. not, that's, that's not ever going to happen. It's not uh, practical. And and we should try and legislate either. This is a big country. This is a very, very large country. The idea that like my mother's a thousand miles away, 1200 miles away. How did, how's that supposed to work? Right. You don't and, have kids. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Then you would be a childless cat lady. Oh, wait a minute. You you are a childless cat lady. Well, to be fair, the cat is my roommate. So Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> you're the you're the roommate of a childless cat lady. There you go. Good I'm for you. just a Swifty, personally. That's Oh well now, now you've hit on every cylinder of of, of crazy yeah. according to them. <laughs> uh, and that, that is that is a good place to leave this. Uh, Sarah, as always, incredible stuff. I hope people take a look at the work that you do over at Raw Story, rawstory.com, the website. Sarah Burris, thanks so much. Thank you. Everybody have an awesome week. I uh, want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the rick.smithshow.com. Uh, should we be creating legislation based on old TV shows like Leave It to Beaver and the Waltons? It looks like J.D. Vance and his world want to. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the rick.smithshow.com. Right back. I've been driving buses for five years, and my day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads, but I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. Then the Teamsters pushed a lot so we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind, the, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. So all eyes going to be on the debate on Tuesday, the, a, a big freaking deal. I, I predict this is going to be the most watched debate, at least of my lifetime. Uh, this is going to be a make or break, I think, on, on both sides. I think the Trump campaign, uh, they need this. The bar is going to be very low for Trump, as we always have a very low bar. If he shows up somewhat sane, somewhat rational, doesn't go off on too much crazy conspiracy theory, uh, there are going to be those, look at Ewan. I think the bar much higher for Kamala Harris uh, because the expectations for her are, are much higher. The fact that she was a prosecutor, the fact that she can spring, string a couple of sentences together, 
Uh, I think I think much higher. But here to share some thoughts on well, what we could expect from debate night. I've asked our good friend, former Ohio congressman and political analyst Bob Nay, to come share some thoughts. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you, Rick. So you've done these debates throughout your career. You've seen a lot of presidential debates. Uh, how's this one rank? How big is this? Well, ditto on how you opened up your show. This is number one in the last 60 years. This is it. This is going to be the most watched debate, I believe, number wise, people wise. But on top of it, it's one of the most important debates because of the, shall I say, uniqueness or weirdness of this election, obviously. And we, we're not in a regular, normal path election where we had a president step out of the election. We had the VP go in. You have Donald Trump. I mean, the whole scenario of the last uh, four years. So this one is big. I, and I also agree with you that, you know, as far as Trump showing up, let's look at the last debate he did. And he has one thing about Trump. He's debated how many times now with Clinton and Biden, you know, et cetera. And he showed up at the last debate. He was a definite restrained Trump versus the, the regular Trump. And of course, Biden, we know what happened in that debate. Now, this time, Kamala Harris is a uh, is a prosecutor by trade before she got into the Senate. So she has a certain amount of ability when it comes to questioning, uh, which she can't do directly. I understand that. But being in a format where she has to to speak, you have to speak to a, a jury. You know, I mean, there's a lot to it that gives her, I think, uh, a step up going in uh, versus uh, you know other people now. There's some disadvantages that Kamala Harris has, and I agree that this is, you know, for her, he just has to show up, and this is for her to go to go better because statistically, and I don't find this outstanding, you know, strange or anything because my friends are like, how do people not know her? Well, they don't. She's been the VP. Who knows yeah. VPs in general, right, Rick? You've seen it well, around. What's, the, what's the knock on the VP? What, what's the, the statement that historically has been said? That a bucket of warm spit? Right, right, right exactly. So um, Trump has to have, if he does this correctly, the goal of having a mantra. You flipped on fracking. You flipped on immigration. You this, you that. He has to do that. He has to pin her down anywhere it changed. Now, right now, people are listening to this and they're saying, well, what about Trump? It, it doesn't matter, okay? We know, we know with Trump, right? We know he'll say anything. But with Harris, she has to be defined because if, when she walks out of there, if she's not defined, the Trump campaign will define her as a liberal, way to the left of everybody else, person who flips on everything, you can't trust her, and they're gonna nail her into the Biden administration. That, that needs to be Trump's goals now. Can he stay disciplined and do it? Yeah, I don't know any more than any other person. So for Kamala Harris, she has to keep you know, on target. And then, of course, the microphones are shut off, which has been agreed to by both sides. Neither candidate can question, question each other. On the Trump side, Rick, this is a biggie. This is not Joe Biden. This is Kamala Harris. And what Trump cannot do, be it verbally with split screen or in any other way, he cannot become, this is my this is my thinking, tell me if I'm wrong, Rick, he cannot become overly aggressive with her because it's not gonna come off well, it's not gonna look good, and then you know anything left of what he wants of the female vote would be in jeopardy. Well, I don't think he's gonna get any of the female vote. I think he's lost that, and I think the campaign's thought that, but I don't think he's gonna be able to do what he did to, uh, to Hillary Clinton. I think Kamala Harris will handle that in in a much, much different way because I think Hillary Clinton handled it poorly uh, and because she was very prim, very proper, you know, very mother may I follow the rules, that kind of stuff. And he kept, you know, you remember him walking yeah. around her and that stuff. Uh, I think Harris would be very, very different, a very different reaction. Yeah. She had a different reaction with Pence when she debated him. I'm speaking. And, yep. but my point on Trump is I think now more than ever, because look, this this is going to be a razor close election unless one of them does something after this debate 
uh, to, to completely set their campaigns on fire. This is yeah. going to be close. The the yeah. stats on the, on this are fascinating going back and forth. The swing states, it, it's, it's fascinating politically to watch this thing go up and then down and over to here for Trump and over the, to there for Harris. So I think it's important, you know, they're after every single vote they can get. And so this is going to be a different medium where I think if he treats uh, Kamala Harris in an over-aggressive way, he might have gotten away with it before. He's not going to get away with it this time. I think it would really hurt him. No, I'm, I'm with you on that. Absolutely. But I, there's there's part of me, and one of the things I'm hoping to see is that if Trump does go off on one of these bizarre conspiracy ch- tangents, that she just goes, I know you asked me a question, but did you just hear what he said? Uh, I mean, there's part of me that goes, can he say that again? <laughs> I'll give him my time to say that dumb stuff again. Uh, I, I'm kind of hoping she does something like that. Well, this is going to be one of those debates that you know, they can't go back and forth. They can't ask each other questions directly. Their microphones are cut off. But as you just pointed out, there are ways to do this. There are ways to throw a question out there. There's no audience, but there's ways to throw a question out there that is is a question directed at the candidate. And you want to see if, you know, in her case, if Trump bites on it. How sad is it that there's not going to be an audience? How sad is it that as a society, we have we have gotten to the point that we do not believe people can behave in a in a group environment and they do it so poorly and so badly that we can't have an audience. It is. It, it's shocking. You know, I was I was looking over the final uh, rules and regs on this. And don't ask me why. In my mind, I thought potentially when they finally finished it all, there'd be an audience. I, I don't know. I'm naive, but I'm looking down the rules and all of a sudden, you know, no audience. And I thought, wow. I mean, historically in presidential debates, well, any debate, I, I can't, I can't imagine when I ran for, I've debated for 24 years at different levels I've ran for. We have always, always had an audience for, you know, for 24 years of debate. I can't imagine where I would even agree that, well, we're not going to have an audience. I, it's, it amazes me. I know it's, Congress isn't the presidential level, but Congress is pretty high. And, uh, you know, it's the federal government. And most people debate with an audience. So who does this help? Who does this hurt? Um, I seem to think it's going to hurt Trump more because he feeds off off the energy. So and, and because, But also, when he feeds off that energy... He says something crazy, he gets a positive reaction. I think he could go even crazier. So I'm curious, in your view, you know, who does that benefit? Who does it hurt? Or do you think it doesn't really matter? Well, I think if there was an audience, it would probably help Trump. Because even if somebody booed, I don't think that would be the end of the world. You know, he's kind of used to that. Polit- political people are used to it these days. But I think you're right, the feeding off the energy. So I think it would... It, it would particularly help Trump. And if they all did behave themselves, still having an audience out there is something that, that he's used to. Yeah. So so who do you, you think it would help Trump more? Uh, Would it hurt? Does it hurt Harris or no? I, I, I don't think it hurts Harris. No. I mean, she's, you know, she's been, she still has in her DNA, the prosecutor role. Where you know you're you're in a small setting, you're in a courtroom, you're you know you're putting together the plan to to go after the person. So she she still has that as part of her. So I think the debate format will be okay. She did good against Pence. I mean, let's look at that debate. She did she did quite well against uh, yeah. against Pence. So the other question that that keeps coming up in my mind: Will this be about policy? Will we? Will we have any idea of of the direction people are going to want to take, or is this just going to be a tax? Will it be meandering and rambling and and low blows uh, and the kind of stuff that we've become accustomed to with with Trump, or will there be you know some kind of hey, this is how I'm going to make your life better? Well, this is what was in my mind. Just as you asked this question, I'm nodding because it was in my mind. Two aspects: one, how will the candidates? you know, react to that. If anybody will go astray of the policy and get into hits, it'll be Trump. We know that. Uh, Harris will restrain herself. Now, she's not going to be a wallflower or a, a doormat you can walk on, but she will, if she, if she snaps back like she did with Pence, I'm talking, she'll go right back into the issue. Now, th- that's her, her forte. Trump, 
if anything, if, if it happens, and I think he'll be, he'll be restrained to a point. I think they've warned him, but if anything happens towards, you know, hitting at another candidate, it's going to be Trump. Now, here's the second part to this. I hope, and I'm being probably completely idiotically naive here. I'm hoping the moderators do not go into the, you know, are you half black? Are you, you know, half Indian? Are you, what about your felony? The whole world, you know, knows about these things. I hope that the moderators do not spend time on that type of thing. Now, no, they can ask. This is where I was going to ask you, you know, the, the last line of questioning on this is the moderators. Will they fact check in real time? Because uh, Trump got away with a lot of, a lot of nonsense during the first debate because nobody pulled him back on it. Um, and, and it is these questions. This is where I, why I asked, will it be about actual policy or will it be about, you know, the clicks and views that, that they hope to get out of the stories that, that come out of the answers? I think that part's going to be up to the, to the most part for the moderators. If they, you know, because the way this runs, there's no opening statements. There is a closing statement. Uh, a question is asked. Each person has two minutes. Then there's a, another minute to rebut. And then under special circumstances, one more minute, you know, somebody who said, said something else that was not related, another minute for one of the candidates. Uh, but I, I think it's up to the, to the moderators to, you know, lay out if they want to ask a couple of questions that I'm going to put in the personal category for either Harris or Trump, you know, fine. One, maybe one question, but if they start down this whole salacious path, the sexy part of politics is, as we call it, the horrid part. But if they start down there, they need to get into a lot of issues out there. So I hope the moderators can set the tone that um, this is going to be an issue debate. Uh, last last bit on this, like uh, you know, the moderators were one part. You know, any predictions? I mean, we we ramp these things up like heavyweight fights. Um, <laughs> thoughts? I you know after the last debate, I, I don't know. I it's mean, a coin you know <laughs> why we turn? It's why we're going to tune in. It's why it's yeah, going to be a record turnout. This one, I literally don't know. I'm going now. I like what you said originally about the bar being lower. If Trump goes in and just doesn't go, you know, all over the place and, and yelling and things. If he does that, he automatically is coming out of the debate with a, you know, okay move. Harris has to come out of the debate. Uh, it, it's more incumbent upon her to come out with, a, you know, not that she did equal, that she did a little better. Now, that doesn't mean she would lose the debate. So, I mean, the debate may come out, a bit of a wash, I don't know, but I, I can't predict them anymore. This is a, this has just been a weird year. Uh, again, I think I think all of it is dependent on which Trump shows up, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. we'll see. I, I got to get your thoughts on this continuing resolution. I uh, before you go because uh, there's a potential of a government shutdown. Is that is that possible in this moment? Well, I actually lived and was alive in a lifetime in Congress. <laughs> Rick, where we actually did budgets, believe it or not. We did them. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. a relic of the past. I'm a relic. And, and of course, I was with other relics. Steny Hoyer, <laughs> Democrat. You know, uh, Alan Mollahan from West Virginia was a Democrat on the Appropriations Committee. And we, we got together. You could do tons of amendments. You went through all the items. And eventually, you had to pass you know, at that time, I think it was uh, 11 or 12 appropriation bills. It might have changed now over time. So technically, that's the budget process. If any member of Congress goes back to the district and says, we passed the budget. No, they're passing continuing resolutions. Now, technically, in a continuing resolution, you're adding a little bit of money. Usually politically, this is how it runs. You add a little bit to make Lindsey Graham and the Republicans salivate in defense spending. Then you'll add a little bit for domestic spending to make the Democrats happy. And then you pass this kick the can down the field to whatever month ahead or the next year, or whatever you're going to do. Now, this continuing resolution, the Freedom Caucus, how many are left in that? Is there over five, seven? I don't know. They keep, they keep kicking them out. They kick Marjorie Taylor three names out. Think about that, okay? So the Freedom Caucus is coming up and they want 
the Speaker Johnson to put the SAVE Act in. Now, remember, they could still make a motion to vacate his seat, which would be complete political suicide, but they could still do it. So there's always this threat. So the SAVE Act would be proving you're a citizen of the United States. It just so happens that Steny Hoyer and I, the late Ted Kennedy and Mitch McConnell, think of that combination, passed the Help America Vote Act where you have an attestation. Everybody in this country that signs attests that they are in fact a citizen. And then if you vote and they know who you are, uh, they can go after you, you know, they can find you and they can charge you with a felony, which is the purpose of what we did. Now, the SAVE Act, I'm not sure if you have to bring a briefcase. Uh, you know, here's my birth record. You know, here's my DNA fingerprint. I, I don't know what they expect you to do, but they want to add the SAVE Act in, which no language really uh, of magnitude should be added to these anyway. They're not budgets. It's not for discussion. So anyway, that's what the Freedom Caucus is trying to do. Now, the speaker wants to just, you know, continue the spending levels and maybe add some more and kick that can down to next March with the new president. The right. Senate, the Democrats, mainly, uh, although some Republicans would want to do this, they want to pass it on till uh, December. They don't want to wait till the first of the year, December, to renew the budget process. So we'll see what happens. There's going to be a lot of chest thumping. This is one thing I can predict. I can't predict who's going to win the debate. I can predict any side that shuts the government down this close to the election is done. Stick a fork in them, finished when it comes to control of the House. Yeah, well, uh, we've said that before, but somehow, you know, like a whack-a-mole, they keep popping back up. This one will undo them. Uh, we, we will see. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to debate night, looking forward to, yeah. to your to your non-prediction. I'm, I thought I'd get a prediction out of you. Uh, probably the smart way to go. Uh, very, very, very politician like. But Bob, as yeah. always, great stuff, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. You know, going to watch the big debate. Uh, I know there's a there's a there's some betting lines out there. Uh, I'd love to hear what, what folks are saying about that. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. It takes a lot to raise a family. A good job, a good salary, and some patience. A lot of people my age are drowning in college debt, but I chose a different path. I'm a member of the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I work hard for my job, and I love what I do. I had a lot of choices for my future, but I made the best choice for my family. IBEW, the right choice. So Tuesday, the big debate, and I'm, I think everybody should be looking forward to this. I mean, I, I cannot wait. Uh, it will be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the National Constitutional Center, hosted by ABC News. Uh, and, and look, this is the bar, the bar, like I said, very high, I think, for Kamala Harris, very low for uh, Donald Trump, which is interesting. The more I think about it, the bar seems always low for Republican candidates. Uh, if they can just, you know, uh, string a sentence together or or not say dumb stuff uh, or not trip. You know, I, I it seems like the bar is always lower for the Republican candidates. You remember the Bush years? I mean, I think they just laid the bar on the ground. Uh, but the, the uh, going back real quick, the person who said that the vice president, the vice presidency well, amounted to what? Nothing but but a warm bucket of spit uh, was Cactus Jack Garner. Uh, John Nance Garner, who happened to be the the 33rd vice president of the United States uh, with with Franklin Delano Roosevelt from 33 to 41. And and look, you know, it's, you don't remember the vice presidents that much unless they do something, you know, like spell potato wrong. You know, something like that. Now, um, or or Mike Pence. I mean, I think people are going to remember Mike Pence because, you know, how many of the vice presidents have their president hoping they get hung. Just, it just, it's just there. 
Uh, and no, how come nobody's complaining about Pence not being on the ticket? What about that loyalty thing? I know Pence probably wouldn't have taken it because look, if, if someone wanted to hang me, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I hope everyone on Tuesday gets their bingo cards out because this, this kind of turned into a thing. It's almost, a, it's such a thing now that even the League of Women Voters have their very own bingo card. Uh, now, of course, they're, they're on the higher minded end of things. You know, will they talk about women's rights? Will they talk about higher education, jobs, the Supreme Court, you know, things like that. You know, God, the flag. You know, will they talk about the right to vote and, and housing? You know, very much on an issue-based, uh, policy-minded uh, position. Then there's the other side of, you know, will, you know, you know, will Donald Trump devolve into his normal, uh, you know, vocabulary of abuse and attacks? Uh, will he bring up the fact that uh, that, Will he, will he again question whether she's black or not? I mean, that that's one of those things you go, really? Why why would you choose that? Uh, will Trump say that he had the greatest economy ever, created the most jobs ever? Will there be those things? And uh, how often will he accuse her of being the most liberal ever? Again, uh, I was watching some some commercials on the... Uh, on the, the screen, we we have a couple of the, the you know the, like the ABC News, the ABC streaming services and stuff, and we get in, inundated with because it's all digital because it's and it's really cheap to put on these digital platforms, but we get inundated with with you know just these campaign ads, which the Republican ones, top to bottom, whether it's you know I'm in Pennsylvania so they go after Casey they go after Harris, uh, but you know they're the most liberal ever, like it's a slur. Oh, you know, they're the most liberal ever. Like it's somehow supposed to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, something they should run from. Now, understand in the red hat world, yeah, that's that's a that's a slur. But for the rest of us, not so much. In fact, I, I agree with some liberal policies. I think we should probably do some more stuff. You know, I had someone throw out at me the other day, you know, a, a Marxist. And I and I said, No, I'm not a Marxist. I I think some of the ideas are, are not bad. Uh, I, I do think that we need to focus on, uh, on class a little bit in this country because uh, the folks like Bezos and, and Musk are in a class all by themselves and the rest of us, well, not. Uh, the wealthy, the powerful, the well-connected, they seem to get what they want and need. And the people who work for a living, the people who punch a clock for a living, folks like you and me, well, we're struggling. And this is where, you know, the anger on the right, like on the left, very justified. And I wish that anger was something that would, would draw us together instead of rip us apart. But this is where we are. And again, I was thrown this word, you're a Marxist. I'm going, no, I, I don't believe in absolute control of the factors of production by government. I think there are things government should and can do and that, that we do collectively together, that which we can't do individually. I think healthcare, uh, and, you know, health insurance being part of that. I don't want the government owning the hospitals, but I think, you know, paying the bill, not a bad idea. One giant pool, everyone in sounds rational, reasonable education. We should have a system across the board that gives people access to the best quality education possible. The free market didn't do it well. The last time a lot of people got left out, a lot of working people, especially the lower end, the poorer of the working people. And then they stayed poor working people, which is kind of the plan, which is why you have these rich people out there going, hey, let's destroy public education. So I guess, is that going to be on the bingo card? Uh, destroy public education. You know, get rid of the Department of Education. Put Elon Musk in charge of that, too. Will here? I guess this is the question. Will Elon Musk be the new Jared Kushner? Will Trump pull pull Musk in like he did to Kush and have him solve all the world's problems. Give him that kind of absolutist power to go and, and, and save the world from, well, liberals, I guess. It's going to be interesting to find out. And this debate, look, I think this is a make or break debate for, for, for Trump. He comes out, looks crazy, unhinged, goes off on attacks. I think he loses a small portion of his base. 
because I think they're tiring of the, the same shtick. But if he shows up saying rational, uh, she's going to really have to do a, a knock-up job because, I th as I said, I think the bar is really, really high for her to, to do to do well, to come out of this with a, with a W. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts. You're going to watch the debate? Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program? Make sure you grab the podcast. Wherever you get your favorite podcast, you'll find ours. Listening to the Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick at Rick at the Rick Smith Show.com. Until next time, this has been the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.